here. Everyone knows that their experiences change from day to day. How they feel about their romantic partner, what, what they choose to spend money on, and even their political preferences. What I'm going to suggest to you today is that there is a surprising hidden force that affects all of these things and their variations from day to day. Ovulation. This is a human egg cell, only an eighth of a millimeter in size, but these tiny cells have extraordinary power, and they affect everything from who a woman chooses as a mate to whether a woman's husband will be the father of, a, of her children or somebody else will be the father of those children, um, and even perhaps political preferences. Why? Because for human evolutionary history, for all of our human evolutionary history, um, and for a long prehistory involving ancestral species, ovulation was the gateway to genetic success for both females and males, the most important event in life. Yet, human ovulation is hidden within women's bodies, and until now, scientists had little appreciation for how important this hidden event is for understanding human behavior. The reason is that the long-held scientific consensus was that humans had completely hidden ovulation. Scientists believe this because humans it do, it, in fact, appear to lack some of the clear outward indications of ovulation that characterize many other species. So this is a sexual swelling in a female baboon. And here's a sexual swelling in a female chimpanzee, our closest cousin, the chimpanzee. These sexual swellings are largest just prior to ovulation, and females might engage in more frequent sex during that period, but they are more choosy about who their sex partners are. Humans clearly don't have these. And women have sex throughout their cycles. So unlike many other species who, have, who time sex so that it occurs just at the point at which conception can occur, humans have sex throughout their cycles and don't have clear outward indications of ovulation like sexual swellings that characterize these cousins of ours. So the thinking was that ovulation is completely concealed in humans and concealed from everyone, including from women themselves. On the contrary, in fact, I would argue that it is a very straightforward biological prediction that women's mating desires, the adaptations that have been forged by natural selection to guide women's sexual behavior, women's desires should be sensitive to the period of high fertility within their cycle. Why is that? So here's the prediction. Because uh, conception probability varies dramatically across the cycle. So it, it, the probability, this is the probability of conception after a single act of unprotected sex. It peaks just prior to ovulation and then drops off dramatically thereafter. A woman who, an ancestral woman uh, who made decisions um, irrespective of where she was in her cycle would not have had, fit, has, have, have had reproductive success as high as a woman who timed certain sexual um, events so that they occurred during the point of, of, of high fertility. So the costs and benefits of certain sexual decisions for women were highest when the probability of conception was itself highest. What about men? A, a furthermore, a straightforward prediction about men is if there, if there are any outward indications of fertility uh, that men might be able to detect in women, then men will, de will evolve to detect them and find them sexually attractive. And the logic is the same. Men who timed their sexual behaviors so that they coincided with this point of maximum fertility would have had higher fitness. Ancestral men would have had higher fitness. They would have been more likely themselves to reproduce. They would have reproduced more, and therefore we expect men who had the, this ability to detect and a preference for those, for the cues that characterize the point of high fertility um, to find them sexually attractive. 
So is it the case that women's desires change across the cycle? Um, in fact, a fairly large literature, some three dozen studies or more, show that women prefer sexy and attractive traits in men more on fertile days of the cycle than on non-fertile days of the cycle. So, for example, women are more attracted to masculine faces, masculine bodies, and even more um, dominant behavior, more intrasexually competitive behavior, men competing with men. Women find these things to be more attractive on fertile days of the cycle. It's not the case that women prefer all of the fe features that they desire in mates more on fertile days of the cycle. Women also prefer warmth, and financial success in partners, but they prefer these equally across the cycle. Those prefer women's preferences for those traits do not shift across the cycle. And yet other qualities that women prefer in mates, and in particular prefer in long-term mates, women prefer those less on high fertility days of the cycle. So fertile women prefer men like Clooney, from Ocean's Eleven, and non-fernal women prefer men like Hanks in Sleepless in Seattle. The leading theory explaining these shifts is this, that women shop for the sexiest partner when fertile in order to pass on high fitness genes to offspring. According to the theory, women prefer, the idea is that women prefer the human equivalent of the peacock's tail. So trait, sexually attractive traits that are more typical of males than of females and that could have indicated the presence of genes contributing to offspring uh, survival or reproductive success in ancestral environments. I'm now going to transition to talking about some specific studies from my lab. So I just want to give you a brief overview of the typical protocol that we use. We bring women into the lab on two occasions, once on a high fertility day of the cycle, and uh, just prior to ovulation, and once on a low fertility day of the cycle, after ovulation but well before menstrual onset, and we do hormone tests to verify, uh, hormone tests to verify that we have pinpointed the day of ovulation somewhere within um, the, the uh, point of a woman's participation during the fertile window, so that we know that a woman ovulated very soon after her participation during that time. So we know that we have captured, uh, captured information, captured data during the crucial fertile window. So we've asked, using these methods, we've asked the question, um, what are the relationship implications of these preference shifts across the cycle that I told you about before? So if a woman is partnered with a man who lacks the features that women particularly prefer on fertile days of the cycle, might she begin to notice men other than her partner on those fertile days? And in fact, this is what we've seen. Um, women who are partnered with the sexually attractive types, the more the Clooney types, they do not experience an increase in attraction to other men at high fertility. However, women who are partnered with less sexually attractive men experience an increase in attraction to other men at high fertility. They report that they notice them around uh, town more often and that they flirt with them more often. This is a robust finding that we've seen now across a variety of studies. Um, we just completed a study that showed a parallel set of results. Women with less sexually attractive partners um, felt less close to their partners on fertile days of the cycle and less satisfied with those relationships. And in fact, um, this study ju was just recently um, reported in the news, and you may have seen some news headlines. Here's how it was reported in the London Times. Sexy, not sensible is the trait fertile women love most in their men, research shows. But um, I thought that a blog post title was particularly nice. Study shows that when women say, it's not you, it's me, it's totally you. So, in these studies, uh, we have also asked women what's going on in their relationships with their male partners. We've asked them to report um, whether there are changes, what, you know, to report on high fertility days and on low fertility days how their partners are behaving toward them. And one of the things that we've found is that women say that their partners are behaving in a more jealous and possessive fashion on fertile days of the cycle. 
um, perhaps a sensible reaction to the fact that women are noticing more attractive men around town on those very days. So women's desires change, and um, men may be responding perhaps to those changes in desires, or it is possible that women are that men are actually picking up on information about ovulation. Perhaps they're picking up on cues of ovulation, and that is what's changing. Um, men's behavior. So we've done a number of studies to address this question. So can men detect ovulation? Here's an example of one study that we did. We simply photographed women at, on high fertility and low fertility days of the cycle as they were entering the lab to participate in these lab sessions. And um, then we took those pairs of photographs. I'll show you. This is a, a low fertility photograph. And here is the high fertility photograph for the very same woman. We took these pairs of photographs, we blocked the women's faces so that there would be no impact of facial expressions, and then we showed them to judges who were not aware of the women's fertility status, and we asked them to choose the photo in which the woman was dressed more attractively. And 60% of the time, judges chose the high fertility photo as the one in which she was dressed more attractively. So it appears that when women are ovulating, they are dressing to impress. Um, and this is a finding that has now been documented across a number of studies and appears to be quite robust. What else might change across the cycle? I'm going to skip this one. Um, it's possible that women's voices change across the cycle. We know that as women mature and move through, um, through puberty, men and women, their voices change. Is it possible that the hormone changes across the cycle also change the way vo women's voices sound? So we recorded women's voices on fertile and non-fertile days of the cycle. Um, I'll play you a low fertility clip first. Can I get somebody to play that? The low fertility clip? Well, we're not going to get it, I don't Hi, think. Hi, I'm a student at UCLA. OK, and now the high fertility clip, please. Hi, I'm a student at UCLA. That's low fertility. If you couldn't tell the difference, those were the same. Okay, maybe we're not going to get it. Women's voices go, uh, are raised significantly in pitch, and I had a very dramatic example, of course, that I was going to play for you. But it was overall a statistically reliable effect. Women's voices raise in pitch, and pitch is a correlate of attractiveness in female voices. Um, what else? Uh, this is the famous underarm study that we did where, to see whether women's body odors are more attractive on fertile, fertile days of the cycle. And in fact, they are. We collected these odor samples on fertile and non-fertile days, and then we had men come in and assess them for us. And men rated women's underarm odors as more pleasant and more sexy on fertile days of the cycle. Okay. So um, human ovulation is clearly not concealed. It's not concealed from women, and it's not concealed from men. Um, what I've shown you are effects in the realm of sexuality. Are there effects outside of the realm of sexuality? Um, so for example, how women affiliate with um, members of their family. This is a study that we did, so let me ask you this question. Based on what I've told you so far, who is the man that a woman should be least interested in talking to when she's ovulating? Her father. Okay, so here this depicts the prediction. And in fact, we made that prediction based on a large animal literature that shows that females avoid affiliating with male kin on fertile days of the cycle. To test this, we gathered women's cell phone records which have this very convenient feature of being about a month long. And we compared their calling patterns on fertile and non-fertile days of the cycle. Women called their fathers less frequently on fertile days of the cycle. And when their fathers called them, they hung up the phone more quickly. OK, so what about in the realm of um, economic behavior? Uh, in fact, uh, Jeffrey, as Jeffrey Miller has famously demonstrated, women, at least those working as lap dancers, uh, earn more money on fertile days of the cycle. 
Christina Durante and colleagues have shown that women prefer to spend more on attractive and sexy clothing on fertile days of the cycle. And in laboratory experiments, economic, um, laboratory economic games in which women are given the power to distribute cash, women keep more of that cash for themselves, especially if they're told that they would be distributing the cash to other women. And yes, it is possible that ovulation even affects voting preferences. This is a study that received a lot of attention. It was very controversial. Showed that um, ovulating women might prefer Obama more than Romney. It remains to be seen whether this effect will replicate it as a single study. Um, but um, it would certainly not shock me to learn that hormones, both men's and women's, affect their voting behavior. So, in summary, um, the hidden and delicate nature of ovulation created fertile minds in humans. Women's minds are sensitive to their own fertility, and this guides their decision-making across a wide ra range of domains. Men's minds, in turn, appear to be trying hard to also pick up on information about fertility. And scientists' minds are hard at work trying to discover the subtle links between ovulation and human behavior. Thank you.